Hi, today's video is going to be very plant based. I'm going to be talking about the structure of the xylem and the phloem, a little bit about transpiration and transpiration rates and how you can increase and decrease them. And we're also going to be looking at the potometer and how that can be used to measure water uptake and therefore be used in transpiration. So let's start by looking at the root hair cell. Um, just a little bit about this. Remember that the root hair cell is a specialised cell because it has an extension, the root hair, which increases the surface area for the absorption of water. Now water enters the root by osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of water from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration through a partially permeable membrane. Some examples will talk about that in terms of water potential, so your definition would be the net movement of water from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential through a partially permeable membrane. But either way, the water is moving from somewhere where there's lots of water to somewhere where there's less water. So what that really means is that the root hair contains little water, there's lots of water in the soil, in this example, so water will move in. Now water travels around the plant in the xylem, X, Y, L, E, M, and that will travel from the roots where it's absorbed up the stem into the leaves and the fruits and everywhere else it's needed. Remember that the xylem transports water and mineral salts around the plant. The things you need to know about the xylem is first of all the arrangement inside the root. So here's a diagram of a cross section and the easy thing to remember is the xylem is the X-shaped structure and the phloem is around the outside. Now xylem is made up of columns of dead cells, so they're completely dead, and you find that they have lignin in them, which is just a very strong substance which helps to support the xylem and prevent it from collapsing under the pressure of the water. Next up we have the phloem, that's another series of transport tubes. Unlike xylem, these cells are alive, but you find that they're, they're pretty much empty, they've just got a few bits of cytoplasm, they certainly don't have any nucleuses. And what they do is they transport sugar where it's made in the leaf to the rest of the plant where it's needed, either to be used for respiration or for storage as starch. Now you find that glucose gets converted into another type of sugar called sucrose to move around the plant in the phloem. Um, that's to prevent any issues with osmosis. Don't worry too much about that detail, that was quite detailed. Just know that sugars are transported in the phloem from the leaves where they're made to everywhere else. Therefore, movement is up and down the phloem, whereas in the xylem, it's simply in one direction, and that is upwards. Just to give you a bit more information about the phloem structure, there are sieve plates, which are some plates at the end of each cell, and they're like sieves, they've got holes in them that allow the sugar through. And then the cells themselves are called sieve plate elements, and surrounding those are companion cells. And they're like little best friends and they have lots of mitochondria which create energy in order to help sugars move in and out of the phloem. Now the arrangement of the phloem in the root, in the cross section, is so we said that the xylem was obviously the X shape, the phloem surrounds it. Now if we take a cross section of the stem, the thing you need to remember is that the phloem is always on the outside in the stem. And the way I've always taught this is if you know what an aphid is, that will help you. An aphid is a small little insect which eats sugar. And what it does is it bites through the stem and it accesses the phloem. And that phloem is the first thing that it comes to, which means it has a ready supply of sugar. So the aphid is happily feeding away on that phloem because that's the first thing it hits when it bites through the stem, which tells you that the phloem is on the outside. The xylem is arranged on the inside. Now if you need to know more information about the structure of the leaf, I recommend that you check out my video on plant leaf structure because that will really help. I'm just going to talk a little bit about transpiration right now. So remember, transpiration is the evaporation of water from the surface of the leaf. And that occurs through small pores called stoma or stomata. You will find that there are increased transpiration rates depending on certain conditions. The amount of water that leaves the leaf is based on the amount of water surrounding the leaf because it's all to do with the diffusion gradient. So obviously water is moving from high concentration to low concentration. Now, we say it's diffusion rather than osmosis because remember the stoma is a hole and in order to have osmosis you need a partially permeable membrane. So we say that diffusion occurs from inside the leaf through the stoma to the outside and we're trying to work out how we can increase transpiration, how we can increase how much water is leaving the leaf. So first of all if it's dry, that means that there's very few water molecules outside the leaf because the air is dry, which means there's lots more water inside the plant and therefore, based on what you know about diffusion, the movement of water will occur very quickly, so water will be leaving the stoma and you'll have high transpiration rates. 
Equally, if it's wet, if it's humid, there's a lot of moisture in the air, a lot of water molecules. So the difference between the amount of water inside and outside the leaf will be very little. So our gradient will be small and therefore transpiration won't be happening very much. Next, if it's windy, all these water molecules will have lots of energy and they'll be moving away from the leaf very quickly. And, the water, and so you'll find that as the water diffuses out the leaf, it gets blown away quickly. And again, that means there's not very much water surrounding the leaf. So transpiration rates will be high when it's windy and equally they'll be much lower when it's still air because the water particles, the water molecules won't be being blown away. Next up, if it's sunny, you'll find that transpiration rates are really high. Why is that? It's quite a complicated answer. If it's sunny, it means that lots of photosynthesis is taking place. What does photosynthesis require? It requires sunlight, but it also requires CO2. CO2 enters the leaf by the stoma. So in order to photosynthesize, the plant needs to open its stoma in order to allow that CO2 in. If you open the stoma, it means water will automatically start to leave. Now here's a side point. If the plant starts wilting because there's not enough water at its roots, what will it choose to do? It will decide to close its stoma to conserve what water it has. However, what's the problem with that? It means that no CO2, carbon dioxide, is entering the leaf, so no photosynthesis can take place. At night time you find that the stoma tend to close because there's no sunlight, so there's no need to have it open and no need for CO2 to enter, so you will find that less transpiration happens then. At high temperatures you find that transpiration rates are increased, and that's just because the kinetic energy of the water molecules is increased. And like the windiness thing, it means that they're just moving out of the stoma, out of the leaf, much faster. And if you're in doubt with this, and you can't remember anything I've said or anything you've learned in your lessons, but you're in the exam, just think about the conditions which would help washing to dry, and you'll certainly pick up some marks. Now remember that water entered the root by osmosis, but you find that because the water molecules are attracted to each other due to the hydrogen bonds, you end up with a continuous chain of water molecules which start from the root, cross into the stem, up the stem into the leaf and out by the stoma, and we call that a transpiration stream. And we also find that as water is leaving the leaf by transpiration, because these water molecules are all attached, it's like a big chain and that actually pulls more water in at the roots in addition to osmosis, and we call that transpiration pull. So what do we use the water that's absorbed by the plant for? Well, first of all, we use it in photosynthesis. Second of all, we use it to help cool the plant so it doesn't overheat. We also use it as a location for chemical reactions to take place. And finally, it's used as a solvent, so it's used to dissolve lots of minerals in. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about was the photometer. The photometer is used to measure the rate of transpiration but in actual fact, it's measuring the rates of water uptake, and I'll discuss what that actually means in a second. But first of all, here's a really terrible diagram of a photometer. So what's happening in this diagram is that water is leaving the leaves by transpiration, and therefore, in order to replace that water, you find that the stem draws in more water from the tube it's attached to, which is attached to a reservoir. And there's a little scale that you can use to measure how far the water's moved and how much water's been absorbed by the plant effectively. So you just read it off of the capillary tube and that will tell you how much water has been absorbed. And this is why the photometer really measures water uptake rather than transpiration because what it's doing is it's measuring the amount of water being drawn into the plant. Whereas if it was measuring transpiration then you would have to somehow measure the amount of water that came off the leaves which is a very difficult matter. So what we do is we assume that the rate of water uptake and the rate of transpiration are identical, even though they're obviously not for all the reasons I just mentioned, which is that some of the water is used in photosynthesis and for cooling the plant. But in, in GCSE science, just know that a photometer measures the rate of transpiration. Now, what sorts of things could you do to the leafy shoot in order to measure the rates of transpiration under different conditions? Well, you could put a bag over the plant in order to increase the humidity and hopefully see a decrease in the rates of transpiration and the rate of water uptake. You could use a hairdryer to emulate windy conditions which would blow water away from the surface of the leaf. You could shine a light on the leaf. You could increase the temperature. So there's lots of things. However, in the exam they like asking you about the setup of the equipment and any flaws and any ways you can fix them and how you can minimise error. So first of all you want to avoid getting water on the leaves so you might need to dry them if, you're, if you accidentally splash them and that's in order to prevent humid conditions being inadvertently given to your experiment when you're not actually interested in that. Second of all you need to cut the shoot under water and that's to stop air getting inside the stem and preventing 
water movement because you'll have an airlock. You also want to cut the shoot at an angle to make sure it has a really good fitting into the rubber tubing. It's important to use Vaseline to seal the joints in order to stop air getting in places where it ought not to be. Finally, you use a capillary tube to magnify the amount of water uptake so you can actually see what's going on. Right, I know that that was a long video and I mentioned a lot of things. It's kind of like a dump of everything that I know about plants. I hope you found it helpful. Remember to like it if you enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon.